Okay, we are here live with Dr. Ed Rivera Valentin from the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. He has his uh, Bachelor's of uh, Physics and Mathematics from uh, Alfred University, and he has a PhD from the Space and Planetary Sciences Division at the Arkansas Center for Space and Planetary Sciences at the University of Arkansas. So I'm looking forward to hearing him talk about his time at Fayetteville. So thank you very much for coming and uh, giving a presentation to us all the way from Puerto Rico. Really appreciate it. I want to thank our sponsors, the University of Central Arkansas Foundation, for supporting this seminar series. And at this time, I'd like for Dr. Riviera to please take it away. All right. Well, thank you for inviting me. So I am Dr. Enrique Valentin. I am a staff planetary scientist here at the Arecibo Observatory in beautiful and not always sunny, but at least not snowing, Arecibo, Puerto Rico. Um, we are, so the Arecibo Observatory is an NSF facility. It is operated under a cooperative agreement by the SRI International Universities Space Research Association, which is the USRA, and La Universidad Metropolitana de Puerto Rico, or otherwise known as UMET. I work with the USRA side, um, and I specifically work in the planetary radar side, um, which is what I'll be focusing on here. Uh, I was actually born in Arecibo, Puerto Rico. I'm told I am the first Arecibeño, meaning someone who was born in Arecibo, Puerto Rico, to work here as a staff scientist. So that's pretty cool. Um, when I was a kid, my family brought me up here at around age three, and I'm pretty sure that's when I decided I'm going to do space science one way or another. Ever since then, I got my family to bring me up here every year. It was part of my pilgrimage. Even after we moved up to the States, I still came down here to visit the observatory. It definitely impacted my life in a positive way, and I'm extremely excited to get to actually, as an adult, as a full-fledged scientist, get to work here. Um, so that is pretty cool. Um, and I hope I can convey that excitement of what we do here and how we do it to everyone today. So first off, a little caveat. We're not the only uh, radar in the United States. There's another one. It is called Goldstone. Um, there are pros and cons about what each does. The Odyssey Will Observatory is still the largest single-dish radio telescope, so we are more sensitive. We're about 20 times more sensitive than Goldstone. But as you can see from this picture, our dish can't move. Goldstones can. And so they can track objects much longer than we can, and so they can collect a lot more data for the same object. Um, but something that I've found as I joined the radar department, um, I actually started here this past August, and not only here, but also in the field of planetary radar. And something I found about the radar scientists is that we're all just a big family. I mean, you can go on Twitter and look at the hashtag Team Radar. We're all very proud of each other's accomplishments and what one radar system does, the other one's happy for, and what each one does is uh, pretty freaking awesome. So we're, we're a happy family. There's no competition going on here, uh, but we are the biggest. And I am from here, so I'm going to be talking about what we do. So the talk here is going to be focused on the Odyssey Observatory and my department, the planetary radar side. So I thought I'd start off the night talking about the history of the Odyssey Observatory. Um, how did it get here? Why did it get here? Who decided to build it, and why did they build it? And why did they choose Puerto Rico? Because of our beaches, obviously. They wanted to go set mojitos, I guess. That is actually a big plus. Um, so the Adesivo Observatory uh, was actually the brainchild of Dr. William E. Gordon. He was an uh, engineer at that time working for Cornell. He was a professor there. And he wanted to study the ionosphere of Earth. And so he came up with this idea of having this really big dish somewhere uh, to emit radio waves up into the atmosphere and collect the radio waves back so we can gather information about the ionosphere. Um, but as with most science, uh, there's not a real single genius. Um, you set out your ideas and it gets through a process called peer review. Um, and your peers 
will help you refine your idea. And so this idea about creating this observatory here was refined by someone called Professor Tommy Gold. And he said, well, when he looked at the plans, he saw that the platform that you see here uh, was not moving. It was stable. And it would just emit and bounce off the atmosphere and come back down. And he said, wait, what if it moves? If it moves, you can track objects. And that's pretty cool when it comes for radar astronomy, looking at the nearby objects like asteroids, comets, and our moon, and even to further away objects like galaxies or stars outside of our solar system. Um, and so they uh, refined this idea into what you see today. But the question is, why Puerto Rico? Not just because of the beaches. So one of the reasons to come to Puerto Rico and put an observatory here is a lot of the observatories of the Earth, when you look at them, they're clustered pretty close to the equator. And that's because, as depicted here, when you're closer to the equator, you can see both the north and southern hemisphere, what we call the celestial sphere. So the way I like to imagine the celestial sphere is if you're standing at the core of the Earth and somehow surviving all the pressures and temperatures down there, and you can see through solid rock because you're Superman, and you can somehow see the latitude and longitude lines on the Earth, and you cast that off into the universe, those latitude and longitude lines turn into the coordinate system of how you can tell where a star is. You define, look at this one direction, that's where you're going to see uh, the Big Dipper, for example. Um, and so in this case, what astronomers do is latitude is what we call declination, and longitude um, is what we call right ascension. Uh, and so that's what you're seeing here in these two images. So when you get closer to the equator, the line directly above you is the celestial equator, go figure. And you can see plus or minus 90 degrees away from that point. And so when you're there, you can see north and southern hemisphere. So here, kind of put it another way, you can see the celestial lines put up onto a nice little star map. You see the celestial equator put there, and you also see something called the ecliptic plane. The ecliptic plane is the plane that the Earth is orbiting around the sun. And so most of all the other planets are also orbiting pretty close to the ecliptic plane. And so when we're doing these observations, uh, when we're looking up at the sky, you can follow the planets going around this line here. And so when you're at Puerto Rico, right, uh, we are at about plus 18 degrees latitude, and so we don't get all the way down to the southern hemisphere at negative 90, but we do go from positive 90 all the way down to about negative 65, negative 70 degrees latitude. Um, however, once you account for the geometry of how the dish works and where the dish is placed and our platform, what we can actually view with the dish is here shown in this yellow line, and that goes from something about 38 degrees latitude to negative 1. So when we're looking at planets, we're still looking at them when they're in their northern approach here. So we're looking at the ecliptic plane, and we're looking at on this side when they're up in the north. All right. But it's not just the fact that you can still see a little bit of the southern hemisphere. The other fact is that Puerto Rico has interesting geology. So here's a map of the geology of Puerto Rico, and you thought this was all going to be physics. So here's some geology for you. So Puerto Rico here is depicted into three typical terrains. The terrain that dominates the center of the island and most of the east and west coast are mountainous terrains. They're exactly how the name sounds. They're a bunch of mountains. Um, the coastal areas are coastal plains. But we also have this very interesting orange section uh, on this map called karst topography. Now, karst terrains are trains that were made after you had things that were dissolved in water. As the water retreated, those materials started coming out of solution and collecting, kind of like what happens when uh, creating limestone objects. Uh, and so a lot of the, the section of Puerto Rico, which encompasses a lot of Adesivo, Adesivo is kind of right now where my uh, mouse is, is all of this karst topography. It's a bunch of little hills, really kind of spherical looking hills. Um, and so here's a picture of kind of how it looks. Uh, it's in black and white because it's from the 1960s. I'll get to why that one's important. But you have all these hilly terrains. You have this easy rock to break apart. 
you have natural sinkholes, and, and you also have a bunch of under uh, cavern areas. In fact, Puerto Rico has one of the largest cavernous regions on Earth. It's in the Cavernas de Camuy, or Camuy Caves. So if you ever come to Puerto Rico, you should definitely check them out. They're very beautiful. Um, but as you can see here, I mean, if you're an engineer and you're trying to figure out where you're going to put the largest dish in the world, well, here the geology just made it easy for you. You have a pit where you can easily put a dish inside there. You can support it with the local topography. And the stone isn't that hard to break. So when we were looking for an area to put the observatory, uh, they looked at Puerto Rico and said, well, we're close enough to the equator to get something in the south. And the topography is amazing. So let's just work here. So this picture was taken kind of a little bit before major construction started on June 1960. But by December 1960, you can see a lot of the blowing away of the mountain, um, making all these roads uh, leading up here, because this was still an underdeveloped section of the island. Though you can see some farmers uh, in the upper left-hand or right-hand corner there. Um, let's get closer into all this blowing away of the land. Um, so here you have these neat pictures. So by the 1961, a few months later, you've blown out the area where you're going to build, and now you're going to start making your own roads and your own topography to actually settle down the dish. But what I find really cool about these pictures is you can see all these interesting layers in the rock. So you can see how all of the limestone was deposited over time. And so this actually shows you, so we are pretty close to the middle of the center of the island. Um, and this part was underwater at one point or another. If, you're, if you ever come visit the observatory, you'll see fossils, marine fossils, on these rocks. And so Puerto Rico wasn't always above ground. Uh, we were underwater at one point or another. Um, when we move forward into the later 1963, 1962, you can see already the dish taking place um, over in the November image. You can see the towers already set up, and they're holding on to the platform. And I'll go into detail about how all that section works. Um, and then over in the March 1963 image, you can see the construction, what we can call the control room. So when we're running the dish, that's where we would be. A lot of the engineering is in there. And also, if you can see at, uh, where my cursor is a little further uh, south from the control room. There's another little building there, and you can kind of see the makings of a trolley. It's how we get all the way up to the platform. It's a very scary ride for someone who's acrophobic, like me. So speaking of acrophobia and what I have to do, I can't imagine what these people had to do when they were constructing the dish. Um, I am amazed about the force that took to make this, especially, you have to remember, this was the 1960s. And this place, this observatory, is still considered a modern marvel. So making this huge dish um, and the platform to hold uh, and the and to hold all the platform up, um, that took a lot, especially for that era. And you can see these people, uh, what I would consider risking my life, because again, I would not be that high on those little strings, um, helping build this place. And what's really cool, and what ties in with me personally, is actually my grandfather at that time period, he drove trucks. Uh, so he would pick up material from the coastal regions and bringing in towards the center of the island. And so he actually helped build this place. He transported material from the coast that was brought in and all the metals that were required to build this place, and he brought it in. So the observatory runs in my blood, basically. Um, by August 1963, construction was basically done, at least for the first part. Uh, you have already here the nice uh, dish set up, all the platform set up, and engineers are already getting ready to play with their new toy. I'm sure they were totally psyched to do that. Um, and then this wasn't it because uh, we still went through a lot of construction phases. We built a lot more offices for our scientists, obviously, and we also did a, a new section for the visitors coming in. Um, notice, though, that in this pre-1998 picture, 
we have we still have those what we call line feeds jetting out from the platform. It wasn't until 1998 that we actually did our major upgrade, our last major upgrade, um, and that's when we included the Gregorian Dome, uh, and that's when we actually launched pretty much the new and powerful phase of planetary radar, because this dome allowed us to achieve higher precisions that we hadn't been able to achieve before. Um, okay, so let's revisit all of that I just said, but go through the nitty-gritty um, in something I call the anatomy of the Adesivo Observatory. So, typical picture. The dish is still, we are the largest single dish radio telescope in the world. The diameter is 305 meters. That's about almost exactly 1,000 feet in diameter. Um, and in, in most science, we work with the metric system. Um, uh, in my type of field, we work in something called MKS units, so meters, Kelvin. The only difference is instead of using Celsius, we use Kelvin. So I'm going to keep the talk with the metric system because it makes sense to me. Um, the platform here is suspended at a height of 150 meters. This picture does not do that height justice at all. When you are walking up to this, and you get onto the trolley, or you even get onto the walkway that you can actually walk all the way up there. I won't do that because you can see all the way down as you're walking up. It's a really scary way to go up there. Um, it's a really, really tall. Um, so to give you an idea, is we are, again, pretty in the middle of Puerto Rico. Um, but that platform is so high that when you stand up there, you can see the ocean from up there, despite the fact of being really far away from the coast. All right, so that platform is suspended up there uh, by these three towers. Uh, most of them are, actually one of them is taller than the other at 110 meters, while the two are 80 meters. You can guess which ones are the short ones. The one at the visitor center, the one closest to you, uh, because that's already at a higher topography. The one uh, clockwise from it is the next shorty one, I suppose you can call it, and then the one uh, again, going clockwise, that one is the tallest because it's set off at a lower part. Now, when you look at this picture, and when you look at most of the pictures of the Adesivo Observatory, and you look at the dish, you think it's a solid dish. Well, you're wrong. It's not a solid dish. Remember, we're working with radio waves. Radio waves have a high, uh, a large wavelength, and so we don't need something solid. We don't need a solid mirror to reflect this power back up. We can have meshed uh, mirror. And that's what the dish is made of. It's meshing. And the meshing are made in these little squares, about 40,000 of these squares. They're about one by two meters. And you can see light still goes through, and you have a nice little ecosystem down there flourishing. And this is where I'm going to kind of detour. Because under the dish, it's really cool. Um, I got to first uh, actually go into the dish when I started this job. And it's just really neat down there. Also, it's a great exercise climbing all up and down towards the dish. And so here's a little warning. If we were here, you would be receiving some radio frequency radiation. But don't worry. You're all safe. So you have to remember, we blasted all of that rock away. There was no life. We had gotten rid of it when we constructed the dish. And over time, life has diffused into this uh, system. And it's now dominated by ferns. Ferns, in, in physics, you can think about uh, diffusion rates, how molecules go from one place to the other to try to equilibrate. And this is how I kind of imagine the biology working out. These plants have a higher diffusion rate in that they more efficiently spread their seeds around, and so they can dominate a certain terrain until other plants who have lower diffusion rate slowly seep in. And so for now, it is fern dominated all over the place. Um, what's also interesting is to see the effect of this radio frequency radiation on this plant life. So here are these two images, and I'll draw your attention to this section here. Notice the purple leaves. Um, they look as if the leaves are burnt. But they're not. Uh, that plant is still happy-go-lucky. The leaves are still happy-go-lucky. But they're really dark purple. And this doesn't just happen with these uh, vines that you see here. Some of the fern, also under the dish, have certain sections that are really dark purple. They look burnt. Um, so it's something that is ubiquitous amongst the plant life down there. We also see 
this very interesting yellow moss. Um, as you walk towards the dish, there's a nice little line where before the dish, green moss, nice and pretty, your normal thing. And then you go into the dish, and then it's yellow. It's really bright. This picture doesn't really do it justice. It's really bright, vibrantly yellow. Um, and we have a team of researchers actually looking at all this. So we recently hired a biologist on our staff, and he's working with what we call the Adesivo Observatory Space Academy. The Space Academy is an institute for the local high school students. They compete to be a part of the institute. Um, and when they get here, we give them novel scientific research to do. They are introduced to STEM research, and then we give them novel projects, not just a little high school fair, redoing some experiments that have been done before. They do something completely new that is possibly publishable. And they divide themselves up into three main groups. We have the physics and engineering department. They get to build really neat toys. Um, we have the environmental group that looks at the environmental impact the observatory has or local high school has um, and how to overcome that. And then we have the biology group. Um, and the biology group is actually looking at the flora underneath the dish and this ecosystem studying what is the effect of radio frequency radiation on this and how is it actually changing these observable characteristics. And we also have a team that will be looking at well, does this affect insects? In fact, the biologist that we hired is an entomologist, so he's perfect to do all this. So, okay, enough of our detour. Kind of really cool stuff under the dish. Uh, let's go back to the dish itself and migrate upwards towards the platform. So, the platform is about 900 tons, um, and you can see that the Gregorian and the line feed are suspended on what we call the azimuthal arm. The azimuthal arm is about 93 meters across, and you can see that's dependent on this circular feature. That's because the arm can turn around in about 360 degrees, and then the features on the arm, the Gregorian dome, and the line feet can move back and forth on it. And so that's how we can track objects in the sky. Now, what is this line feed I keep saying? The line feed is this section here. Some of us call it the ray gun. Back in the good old days, we would shoot radio frequency radiation from this object. And then once the radiation bounced back up uh, from the sky, bounced back down onto the dish, it would be collected by this line feed. So the focus was a line instead of a point. Uh, we then upgraded to the Gregorian dome, shown here. Uh, the Gregorian dome can also emit uh, radiation and then collects it. I'm going to show you a ray tracing diagram so you can see where the uh, magnetic re or electromagnetic radiation with all the photons bounce back up and how all that looks. So here's one of them. Uh, this was kindly provided by Dr. James Richardson. He works here and you can follow him on Twitter. Uh, so when we have the platform uh, the Gregorian dome here, you can see it emits radiation, it hits the dish, it bounces off, and then it can hit an object in the sky. Um, that object will then emit radiation, just follow the lines backwards. It will hit the uh, dish. The dish will then focus it onto a point. We move the platform, the Gregorian dome or the line feed, depending on what system you're using, collect the data. All right? If we're using the Gregorian, which is what the planetary radar department normally uses, uh, the waves do a little bit extra, and that is they go into the dome, they get reflected off of what we call the secondary reflector, focused onto the tertiary, where it finally then gets all the way back up to us at the receiver room so we can analyze it. So that's kind of the basic steps of what we do at the observatory and how we do it. Um, and now let's look at what we actually end up doing here. So we have three scientific departments. And what's cool about our scientific departments is that we go from Earth all the way up into the rest of the universe. So we have the Space and Atmospheric Sciences Department. They study the ionosphere. So the original idea for the observatory member was actually looking at the atmosphere. And so we still do that to this day. We've had some pretty awesome uh, discoveries in that department. They were able to actually find that there are different sections of the ionosphere, and we have weird metals going on in there. Um, we then go further out, so not just emit radiation up into the ionosphere, but also then emit radiation into near-Earth objects, like asteroids and comets. We can emit all the way to the moon, to the nearby planets, like Mars, 
Venus, Mercury, all the way out to the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. So that is the planetary radar department. But we can go even further with radio astronomy. We can go to stars in our own galaxy, to galaxies beyond ours. Right? So we hit almost every section of modern day astronomy from all the way to the bottom of the Earth to all the way up in the sky. But like I said, I'm in the planetary radar department, and so that's what I'm going to focus all of this talk on. And shout out to NASA. Uh, it funds our department through what is termed the Near Earth uh, Observations uh, Program. Our department is made up of these awesome people. We have Dr. Mike Nolan as our director, and his expertise is almost in everything in planetary radar. He's a pretty awesome guy that I'm learning a lot about from. We have Dr. Ellen Howe, who studies the asteroids and comets, and she's pretty cool because not only does she use asteroid uh, radar, she also uses infrared uh, information using other telescopes to better understand comets. Um, we have Dr. Patrick Taylor. Uh, he was the shy one that kind of ran away. Um, he is our local expert on asteroids and processes that can affect their orbit, and we'll get to why we want to know what an asteroid's orbit is. Um, then we have a new hire, Dr. James Richardson and myself. Uh, we're learning about planetary radar, we're learning how to use this place, um, and we both focus on different sections of what was called the cratering. Um, so once an asteroid hits a body, uh, the crater produces, and how you can backtrack from those craters on the body to how the early solar system was. And then we have an, an emeritus uh, individual from our group, Dr. or soon-to-be, I won't jinx it for her, Dr. Uh, Sandy Springman. She left our group to the University of Arizona, the Lunar and Planetary Lab, to get her PhD. Uh, but she was here about two or three years. She's a local expert on radar. She's pretty awesome. So. Now that you know who we are, uh, what do we do? So going back, we use the platform. Uh, and the typical night or day, because it doesn't matter whether it's night or day when it comes to radar, we go into a control room, we warm things up, and we start generating about 2 megawatts worth of power. Now, we are a mechanical system. In thermodynamics, you learn that there's an efficiency factor that you have to include in almost all of these equations. That's because some energy is lost through the mechanical process. So though we're starting off with 2 megawatts worth of power, we don't end up emitting 2 megawatts worth of power. We emit only 1 megawatt. We have two what we call klystrons. They're inside the Gregorian dome. Each of them emits 500 kilowatts of power. That power will then get radiated towards the dish, bounce off, hit the asteroid. The asteroid will radiate that back down, bounce off the dish, collect itself into the platform following the ray tracing diagram I had showed you, and then we get the information. Now the cool thing about what we do is that in most of astronomy, it's passive astronomy. And that is, you sit there and you hope that the universe decided to emit a photon towards you. And you hope that your instrument is good enough to collect that photon. However, in planetary radar astronomy, you control the light. You control the amount of power you're emitting. You control how that light looks, what its polarization is, how much power, because, or even um, you can send out codes. So instead of just sending out a constant wave, you can send out chirps or uh, stuff that looks basically like Morse code. That's a pretty cool part about what we do. We control the photons. We have information about the photons that we're emitting. We know what we did, so we know what we should expect, and that gives us a lot of information about what the object that we're hitting is. And so what do we measure? OK, we're working with photons. And photons, there's the whole idea of the duality principle, right? So you can think about light as a particle. So if you think about it as a particle, and you emit a marble up to an asteroid, and you know the marble speed, speed of light, it hits the asteroid and comes back to you. So as long as you know its speed, and you can measure the time it took for that marble to come back to you, you can measure then the distance. How far away is that thing from me? But then going back to the fact that light can also be a wave, you can measure something else. So as you emit the wave up into the asteroid, asteroid hits, the wave hits the asteroid, but if the asteroid has a velocity, it's rotating or it's coming towards you, when the wave comes back to you, it's going to be changed. This comes from the idea of that Doppler shift. So we have this canonical view in most physics textbooks of you have this emergency vehicle, 
it's coming towards you, it has its lights on, it has all the sound. As it's coming towards you, the sound gets sharper and sharper and sharper, and as it goes further and further away from you, it gets lower and lower and lower. That's the Doppler shift. And that's because as the vehicle is coming towards you, when it emits one light, the next time it gets closer and closer towards you, the peaks of the waves are now closer than if the object was uh, not moving. So that changes uh, how you would hear it. Uh, the same thing would go with radar astronomy. It changes uh, the frequency of these things, so we're doing a Doppler shift here. And with that, we can measure the rotation and the velocity of the object. Because uh, as photons hit one side of the asteroid, if you think of it as a sphere, those waves are going to come closer to you, and the waves that are hitting the other side of the object that's moving away, those things will be shifted negatively. Um, and the next thing is, remember, we can control the type of light we're emitting. So we don't just have to emit a wave. We can emit a circularized wave up there. And how that object re-emits that wave tells us a lot about its roughness properties. So from that, we can extract, are we looking at something that's rocky? Are we looking at something that's metallic? Or are we looking at something that's icy? So we can not only tell the distance, how that object is moving, but we can gain also information about the object itself. All right. One of the first experiments that we end up doing when we open up a night is what we call the continuous wave experiment. So try, uh, getting us to visualize what we do here. So we can emit a wave out into the asteroid, hits the asteroid, the asteroid's moving towards you or away from you, it's going to be shifted, but if the asteroid's rotating, that's also going to shift uh, the waves. And so when all of those echo returns come back to you, they'll kind of look like that bottom diagram there. It's all this mess, all these different echoes coming around you. But you can play math games, it's called a Fourier transform, to take out information from this. And one of the first diagrams we can get in the night is what we call this Doppler shift diagram. All right, and this one was done semi-recently. It was in January 2016, or 26th, um, and it was for this famous asteroid, the 2004 BLA-6. It made the news. It was about uh, three times the Earth-Moon distance from us. It turned out to be a diameter about 300 meters. That's pretty big for an object coming that close to us. And it turned out it also had a moon of its own. Um, and so later on in the talk, I'll show you how you can actually look at this diagram and tell, oh, it has a moon. It's a binary system. So in the x-axis here, we have the, that Doppler shift, right? And so the positive numbers here are telling you information about the waves that are coming towards you. The negative numbers are telling you about the waves that are moving further from you. So the width of this diagram is telling you something about the size of the asteroid you're looking at. And the shape of this is going to tell you something about is it binary, um, and also more information about the shape of the asteroid. And I'll tell you why we care about that in a bit here. Now, typically when we send out information from the radar teams, you don't end up seeing this graph. You end up seeing something called the Delay Doppler Radar Image. And that's this image here. Um, but it's, first, it's good first to kind of understand what the continuous wave uh, diagram there means. So when you see one of these Delay Doppler images, it's still in the x-axis. You have the Doppler shift. Again, talking about things moving towards or away from you. And in the y-axis here, you have the range. That's that time delay. How long did that photon get to get uh, to, for me to hear it? Tells you the distance away from it. And so if we look at the image here on the left-hand side, you see then that if we were working with a perfectly spherical object, and if you were at the tip of that equator, those photons would come towards you before any photons on the side, right? And the further away you get from that, the photons will take longer and longer to get to you. So in circles going from the equator outwards, you're going to have areas of constant range. But then if the object is rotating, then in lines you're going to have areas of constant Doppler shift, meaning those photons are going to experience that same velocity vector either towards you or away from you. All right? So then you get to this weird effect, which we call the north-south ambiguity. You can look at these areas where I have depicted here the blue dots, where you're going to have the information tell you, I am the same distance to you, and I also have the same velocity to you. Because of that, when I'm looking at that signal return, that echo, 
I have no idea if you're in the North Hemisphere or in the Southern Hemisphere. So when you do one view, and that means one of these passes, you can't tell where you're looking at the asteroid. You need multiple passes, multiple views, so then you can track an object on this image, and then that will help you tell whether you're in the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere. Don't worry. I have a video that I'm going to show you that was produced by one of our scientists here, and it at least has helped me a lot kind of visualize this ambiguity. Now, the colors or the brightness that you see here in the pixels, that's the signal strength. That's how much of the signal is being returned to you, okay? All right. Um, one of the first things we can get from this image is the size. So if you look at this red line, so from the edge of the echo all the way back to the last time you see uh, the arc here, that it would be the radius of the asteroid. And we want to know the size. And you'll later get to know why we want to know the size. But you can figure that one out. Um, one of the so let's compare this to an actual uh, object. And so if we were to take a spacecraft, fly all the way up there, like was done here by Hayabusa, looking at Itakawa. It took this image. It was close enough that the solar radiation that's coming towards the comet or that asteroid and bouncing off and hitting the spacecraft. All right, it was close enough that it was able to gather enough photons to get a nice picture. If we were from Earth, we wouldn't be able to gather enough photons. So we were able to get this really neat image. From Earth, though, we were able to get this radar image. Again, photons that we sent out and we got back. And you can see the delayed Doppler image compared to the actual image. You're able to see, you, you can extract a lot of information about the shape of the object and get prepared for when you send missions up there. So when we get to these continuous wave information, when we get the delayed Doppler images, um, and we are able to look at these over time, one or two nights, we can start extracting what are called shape models. It's all this information combined to try to figure out how does this object actually look. And that's important when we're talking about asteroid prevention, impact prevention, um, and sending missions up there, obviously. So let's now kind of revisit everything I've just said, but with really cool visualizations. Um, so these visualizations I'm about to show you, these movies are available on YouTube. Uh, you see the link there. Uh, they were produced by Dr. James Richardson. He's the new staff scientist here. Really awesome. Um, they definitely helped me out. So here you have a video that's going to show you how the continuous wave, that Doppler shift uh, spectrum we get changes as this irregularly sized asteroid or uh, rotates. And then you can see the delayed Doppler image that we would get. All right. So let's hit play. Hopefully you can see this nicely. All right, so you see when it is the widest, the spectrum widens. When it's head on, the, way the spectrum gets shorter. And you can see the delayed Doppler image, how we are then able to perceive the rotation of the object. The next one is how we can tell if it's a binary. So you, this one's pretty obvious that the binary is that little peak that you see in the spectrum. So again, here in the bottom, we're going to look at that spectrum that we're receiving back. At the top, you are looking at the delayed Doppler image. And again, it's as if we had a, a spacecraft looking towards this binary system. All right, let's look at this pretty awesome video. So you can see the peak. That peak is the, uh, the satellite. As the satellite then goes into the shadow of the alpha, we still see it, but then poof, it's behind it, so that peak leaves. And then the peak comes back once it's behind, uh, once it's back out of behind the asteroid. And so looking at how the peak moves along the spectrum tells you a lot about its rotation uh, rate right around the alpha. And then here it's back. All right, the next one I'm going to show you is to visualize the north-south ambiguity. Again, that's when you have these concentric circles where they are a constant range away from you, and you have the lines that are constant velocity, constant Doppler shifting. And the way this image works is you're going to focus on that delayed Doppler image. It's, it's going to show you how you're looking at 
different sections of the asteroid, one in the north and one in the south, but once you see it actually move, you can definitely tell which one's in the north and which one's in the south. Though right now, looking at it, you can't tell. You can see here how the pixels move, and you can start telling what's, in, what's above and what's below. And then when you want to look at these, go to Dr. James Richardson's YouTube page. He has a bunch of others, uh, animations of these processes, really cool stuff. Now, we don't just look at asteroids. Like I mentioned, we also study the planets. So Mercury was one of them. Um, when we first started the LSU Observatory up, we were able to determine the Mercury's rotation rate, and we were able to improve it back in 1965. But one of the big things for me um, as a planetary scientist was that when we looked at the North Pole of Mercury, we were able to see it has ice. The North Pole of Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun, has ice in these craters. That was weird. But it turns out that where these craters are at the poles, their topography makes it so that some of the sections are always in shadow. And so they get really, really cold, and they're able to preserve ice that gets migrated to Mercury via comets or other processes. So the Odyssey Observatory was able to confirm one of these results. I believe it was another radar that first detected it. Um, later on in 2011, after our upgrade, when we added the Gregorian Dome, we were able to re-image it at better resolution. And so here in this image, the yellow is showing you the power of the radar echo that we're receiving back. And it confirms the earlier results. And we're seeing that some of these craters, all of the floors are in permanent shadow. And, can, and we're seeing that they have some sort of ice coming from it. And this wasn't just using radar. We sent a mission up there called Messenger. And Messenger confirmed all of our discoveries uh, radar-wise from Team Radar. Uh, and they were able to see that, yes, Mercury has ice up on its poles, which is really cool. We are also able to see this for the moon. For the longest time, we thought the moon was really, really, really dry. It turns out it's not that dry. We sent a bunch of missions up there to not only confirm this, but study where the water is and how deep that water is. The other thing we could do with radar is not only see where ice is, but remember, we don't care what type of weather is going on. We can study in the middle of a storm. It could be raining, and we could still be conducting our research. That's pretty cool, because if you were a passive astronomer uh, using telescopes, if the seeing is bad, if there's clouds overhead, that's it. Your experiment is done. And I see a lot of my friends on Twitter going, oh, I can't run my experiment tonight. And I'm here going, yep, I can still do my job. This is awesome. Um, and this comes into play when we're looking at Venus. Venus has a very, very thick atmosphere, about 95 bar. Um, and you can't look at its surface uh, using visual methods because the clouds are so dense. But radar comes to the rescue. You can still see the surface of Venus using radar. Our wavelengths are big enough that they don't care that there is a cloud there. They just keep going. It's kind of like honey badger. Radar doesn't care. So we're able to get a lot of information about the surface of Venus. We were able to see that it's a little weird in that it doesn't have a lot of craters. An old surface that isn't modified by other geologic processes like water or plate tectonics or winds should be dominated by craters because we know, for example, the moon dominated by craters. So the fact that the, Ven that the uh, Venetian surface doesn't have a bunch of them means that it's rather young. Uh, geologically young. Some process had to happen to cover up the scars of these craters. And one of them, as you can see up, is Maxwell Montes. It's, it's volcanic. The surface of Venus is dominated by a bunch of ancient volcanoes. So we're seeing a lot of magma being erupted on the surface, covering up all of the scars. And we were able to tell this with the awesome power of radar. The other cool thing about radar when we're talking about looking at the planets is the fact that radar can not only looks at the surface, it penetrates a little bit below the surface. So when we emit out to the planets, we're using a wavelength of about 12.6 centimeters, and radar can penetrate about to a depth of 10 times that wavelength. So we're talking about penetrating down to a depth of one meter.
So when we emit radar out into the planets, we're not only seeing the surface, we're seeing just about down to a meter. So when we're looking at, for example, this image from Mars, and we compare it to a uh, nice picture from Viking, we are able to tell a lot more that has happened in the past. We can see these lava flows, the ancient lava flows coming out from the largest mountain on Mars here. Um, you can also see some of these interesting patterns. You can see different uh, times that magma was erupted from here. So it's a, definitely a powerful tool when you're looking at the geologic history of a lot of these planets. Now, our main focus here, though, is the asteroids, and that's because NASA has this new NEOO initiative to study the near-Earth objects and observe all of them. And so Adesivo and other radar groups have championed that cause, and we've able to, been able to characterize uh, the, the near-Earth asteroid population. And here's one of the examples. So the interesting thing about objects is most of the time when you look at an object that's spherical, it's because it's large enough that has enough gravity that's able to push itself into a nice sphere. The fact that we're looking at some asteroids that are spheroidal, not all spheres, but are spheroidal, tells you something about their evolution, not exactly the gravity, but how they were chunked up, how they were broken up, and how they got thrown out, and what processes has acted on them. But you still get your weird potato shapes flying around, like this one. Uh, kind of reminds me of some states. I don't know which one. You can also kind of see an alien face. You have an eye here. Another eye over here in the mouth right here. Hope you saw my cursor there. Um, one of the major things that we've seen, though, in studying these near-Earth objects are binaries. Asteroids have moons. Everyone has a moon now, right? Uh, about one in six of these asteroids observed are binaries. They uh, rotate rather rapidly. Um, we can see that they're pretty close to circular orbits. Um, and most of the time, the secondary is tidally locked, so it kind of looks like our moon, Earth-moon system, where the same face looks at the Earth as it rotates, so it's rotating and orbiting at about the same rate. Now, when these objects get a little close to each other and continue their dance, you can have something called a contact binary. And at this point, you get something that I think kind of looks like a dog bone, to be honest. Um, and so you can see here, these two asteroids got a little close to each other. They got a bridge starting to form between them, and you have the contact binaries. We also have really strange stuff, like this object. Did you catch it move? It rotates in only five minutes. That's really, really, really fast. All right, let's try it again. And poof, did you catch it move? Really fast. All right, so we're able to characterize all these objects. Um, but why? Why do you want to characterize the near-Earth objects? Why is there this new NASA initiative, semi-new? Um, and one of the reasons is because when you go back to solar system formation models, you had all these gas flying around the sun. It was able to creep into planetesimals. The planetesimals hit each other. You were able to start forming planets. Some of these leftovers, though, remained in what we call the asteroid belt because Jupiter, basically, with all its massive gravity, didn't allow planets to form in that area. During, depending on which solar system formation model you have, Jupiter and Saturn start moving around. They start flinging objects around. So these asteroids within the main asteroid belt can start flying into the interior solar system and start crashing further into the planets. You can get events like the late heavy bombardment. Via other gravitational interactions, you can still migrate some of these asteroids from the asteroid belt into near-Earth objects. And so when we're studying these objects, we are looking back in time, basically. We are looking at planetesimals that later hit each other to form planets. They just weren't allowed to because they're in the wrong zone of the solar system. So looking at this lets us test our solar system formation models and gives us a lot of insight into how our system formed. The other one is semi-new, uh, especially because of the technology that has come up, and that is resource utilization. These asteroids are abundant with these metals, uh, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, osmium, iridium, and platinum. So a bunch of companies are actually already thinking, can we go there? Um, is it, can we go there enough and collect enough stuff to make up for the price of going there? So there's all these ideas, all these new uh, companies trying to get all these really awesome resources in these asteroids and 
the scientists are thinking, cool, you can go there, and then I can study the rocks and learn a lot more, and you can make money. Yay. Everyone wins. But there's another one. There's the one that all of mankind cares about. So, natural disaster. We have hurricanes, we have tornadoes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, avalanches, mass movement events, right? Some of these, we can tell people, hey, a hurricane is coming in weeks in advance, days in advance, all right? Tornadoes, we can give a tornado watch, we can give a tornado alert. We can at least give people time to move. A tsunami, if an earthquake happens and starts off the tsunami, when we can tell people at different sections that, hey, the tsunami is going to arrive or about this time. It's a small, you can at least give a couple of minutes, still small delta T there, but you can give some sort of warning. You give some alerts with volcanic eruptions. The volcano starts a little shaking, a little rumbling. Um, you think, well, something might happen, but you're not confident. It's just you still want to alert the people. With earthquakes, you can look at the data and you can look at the trend and kind of say something might happen in the next 100 to 500 years, but you're not really certain, right? The same thing with avalanches. A uh, new snowfall came in. You know about the snow that was there. You can give an alert. Be careful, skiers. If you touch the wrong thing, something might happen. Some of these, we can warn people. Some of these, we can't reliably warn people. It's just the nature of the processes. Um, with an asteroid, you can definitely warn people. That's part of our job in Team Radar is where are these things? Because if we can observe them and, and provide a very high precision, their position in time and space, where they are for those times that we're looking at it, we can plug and chug that information into models of how the planets move along in our solar system, how everything we know is moving along our solar system, how their gravity works. We can plug that information in and see how the asteroid will orbit over time. We can then categorize it. Is it going to hit us one day? Is it potentially hazardous? Right? And we can give advances of about decades to hundreds of years. This thing might touch us one day in the next hundred years or in the next decade or in the next 50 years. That's important to know. But most importantly from these is that it's totally preventable. Out of all the other natural uh, disasters I spoke about, you, we don't have a weather machine yet. Star Trek did, but we don't. So we can't avoid a hurricane. We can't avoid a tornado yet. We can definitely avoid an asteroid spike. How? Well, we can blow it up, right? Looking at the asteroids, looking at the shapes, studying the size, studying their densities, we would then be able to inform people, all right, this is the type of yield you would need your explosion. So it breaks it apart into small enough pieces that when it comes back down to Earth, it's vaporized mostly in our atmosphere. Because if you break it up and the pieces are still big, you're just spreading out the energy of this asteroid as it's colliding with Earth. There are other methods also. You don't just have to nuke it. Um, you can, there was this neat uh, method that you can just put mirrors around it and focus solar energy on it, and you can start breaking apart these things. Um, the other method is changing its orbit. But for this, we need to observe the asteroids. We need to observe where they're going to be, where they are, and where they're going to be. Because for this, the more time you have before this object strikes you, the less you have to change its velocity. One of the ways that has been suggested, is depicted here by this neat cartoon, is that you could actually just spray paint one of the sides of the asteroid's white. Because it's white, it's going to emit a lot more photons. That little tiny pressure over time is going to be enough to move the asteroid, to adjust its orbit just enough that it doesn't strike us. You could also put a solar sail on it so that it's catching some of the solar radiation. That's enough pressure to hold it back and start moving it off. Um, there's also what's called the gravity uh, tractor, and so you take a satellite up there and everything that has mass, that has matter, has mass, has, is emitting uh, gravity. So if you take a little satellite and you put it there, in enough time, uh, it's going to be able to tug on the asteroid to change its orbit enough, again, to avoid it hitting us. But for this, we need to make sure we are observing these asteroids and categorizing them. So one of the main tasks that we have here at AO and other radar places is we need to find them before they find us. And so we're categorizing them. Are they typical near-Earth asteroids? And those are orbits that are within the Martian orbit, 
or are they potentially hazardous asteroids, PHAs? Those orbits are within the terrestrial orbit, and they also touch portions of it. And so the job here is we want to figure out where they are so that we can stop them. We want to know their shape, because if we're sending something like spray painting one side, we need to know what we're going, how much we're going to send up there. We need to know their size, because if we know their size and information about are they rocky, are they icy, are they metallic, then we can maybe actually just blow it up. So basically, what we do here at the observatory, what my title should have actually been for this talk is the Odyssey Observatory, our first line of defense against impacts. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much. Um, you can also follow all these awesome people on Twitter who've worked here or currently work here. And you can also follow the Odyssey Observatory Twitter and the Odyssey Radar Group. So thank you very much. Wow, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Very cool. No problem. All right. Questions, comments, concerns. <laughs> Do we have any questions from our audience here at UCA? All right, what's our question? Okay, so you were talking about how the dish was built on like um, a sediment that was like deposited out of the uh, to solve like the waters as they receded, right? Um, and are there any worries like um, of other sinkholes like forming and then deteriorating like the structure or, of the radar? Good question. So as you, oh good, it went back to the image. So as you can see here, the radar is, uh, the dish itself is suspended on part of the more stronger rock sections. And the platform itself is really, really backed up with all of these towers around it. So we're pretty OK with the platform. Um, when it comes to other effects that might damage the dish itself, we've actually had an earthquake come around. Um, and it kind of hurt one of the lines that are actually suspending, holding everything up. But we were able to fix that. Um, when it comes to the rocks, we did have a bunch of geologists that came by here. They studied the train. They made sure that it might not evolve to something that would just open up and swallow everything up. Uh, we have had geologists that still come to check the area out because there was a, remember, this was built in a karst sinkhole. Uh, so we've made sure that the sinkhole is not going to get bigger um, and that our dish is going to remain safe. So we have checked up on that. That is a cool question, though. Uh. All right. Uh, I want to uh, make sure that the people listening on the internet either use the Q&A feature on Google uh, Hangouts. You can type in a question there, and we'll be able to see it and respond to it. Or if you are listening, uh, watching online, you can also use the uh, hashtag GHO Seminar, and we'll see that on Twitter. So any other questions here in the room? I think I got a few. Nick. Uh, I was wondering, just how small of objects can the observatory see? You said they saw the after the past era, so those 300 meters. How small can we find? How small can we find? So obviously, if you are get really, really, really small, then when you send out the power that's emitted by the dish, uh, then not a lot of the signal will return. And so what we are focusing on here is the signal-to-noise ratio. So how much of the signal are we receiving with respect to noise? And so if it's too small, then the noise might win out. So I believe we've been able to spot objects in the 100 meters range. Um, it also depends on how far it is. So the closer it is, uh, the smaller it would be that we could see it. The further it is, then the opposite would be. It would have to be bigger for us to be able to see it. So it's a, it's a little complicated in that it depends on how far it is from you. Uh, I think I'm not recalling exactly the smallest object we've seen, but I know it's on the order of higher orders of tens of meters. Okay. Interesting. It's it's when you when you take the the frequency of the uh, the radar the of the, the photons. And then you say, like, lambda f equals the speed of light. You can calculate the wavelength. That's on the order of, what, uh, 16 some odd centimeters? I think I calculate 12, 13 centimeters. Yeah. And so the wavelength is pretty small, but really you're, you're, it's the power. You've got to get the reflection back to get enough to hit the dish to bounce up to the receiver. That's really cool. That's really cool. 
All right, another question. Hey. Hey. All right, hey. Uh, so you were talking about the, the binary asteroids and how some of them had been like fused together, or like the, that were together and so they looked like dogs. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering if we knew what kind of process went to actually fusing them together. They just run into each other, or was there something fancier? <laughs> um, okay, so the way I've always imagined this um, is if, so if you have these objects that are orbiting each other, boom, 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 right? The closer and closer you get to each other, the more gravitational attraction an object on the tip of this asteroid and the tip of this asteroid is going to have towards each other. So over time, they're going to want to start moving towards each other, those little objects on top, like boulders or whatever. So the closer I get, the more this bridge forms, right? These objects start to uh, you can kind of imagine like mass slides starts moving in and kind of forms this bridge between them. And then they get stuck like that and you get a dog bone. Um, <laughs> one of the real cool ones is Cleopatra. So if you have the time, Google search the asteroid Cleopatra. It's, it looks like a dog bone. It's just so cool. <laughs> but yeah, it, just, it gets closer and closer, so objects at the tip start getting more attracted towards each other and bridges formed. Okay, pretty cool. I, I, oh, you got a question? All right, go ahead. So you were talking about how you could use the radar to determine velocities and like how the asteroid is spinning and whatnot. Um, is there any like speed at which the asteroid spins where it starts to be kind of fuzzy, or can you track them up to like um, insanely high speeds? Good question. Um, the highest rotation velocity that we can observe without getting fuzzy. I'm seeing if. Uh, I'm phoning a friend here. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question that I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Anybody else here? It is true. Like the faster rotates, the fuzzier and fuzzier it's going to get, right? I'm hearing ums uh, from. Oh, yeah. I'm hearing ums. <laughs> is there a resolution in the air when you get too fuzzy? <laughs> you stumped him also. <laughs> I don't know, it doesn't really get fuzzy, it's just Do you want to get the same resolution. <laughs> <laughs> so you're go ahead, you I'll interpret. If you don't want to be in front of the camera, it's fine. <laughs> Well, I guess the fuzziness of it is really just the frequency resolution that you have. And if something is rotating really fast, it has a really wide bandwidth. But if you just course in your frequency resolution, it, it, it doesn't really look fuzzy. Um, I guess the bigger problem is if you try to take a radar image of it, then you really do get a fuzziness because it's actually rotating while you're integrating the signal. Mm. And in that sense, yes, it does look fuzzy in an image, a radar image, but not so much in just the frequency-only spectrum, which I think Ed showed at one point. I did. So the spectrum that he's talking about was that continuous wave example I showed you. So if it's spinning, like I said, if like he said, if it's spinning a little too fast, it's wire. But the fuzziness would come in when you're looking at those delayed Doppler images because what we do a lot is we take one view and then we send another signal out and we take another view and we just start making a composite image of all those signals. And so if the object is moving a little too fast, it's that when you start compositing, putting all those images together, it will end up looking fuzzy. But in the spectrum, it shouldn't. <laughs> Good question. Fantastic. Do we have any other questions? I've, I've got one. I, this was sort of uh, prompted by some of the recent discussions on Twitter uh, about the 30 meter telescope in Hawaii. Uh, there's been some new, um, um, or I guess continuing controversy over the building of that telescope on that mountain because of its sacredness to some of the indigenous people. And so I was curious if, if in the building of Arecibo were there any indigenous tribes or, or uh, people that were there before, or did the Spanish pretty much wipe everybody out and that was the end of that? So, um, 
the indigenous people of Puerto Rico, the Tainos, um, for the longest time, we actually thought the Spanish had basically completely wiped them out. Okay. Um, we later did find that there were uh, a set of people, I think it was towards the southern side of the island, that did have significant Taino genetics. Um, in, pretty much in Puerto Rico, you have a good mixture of the Spanish coming in, the Africans that were brought in as slaves, and the Tainos. So we're all mutts here, pretty much. But some portion of our population were able to retain a lot of the Taino genetics, but they had lost a lot of the cultural perspective uh, from the Tainos. We're actually rediscovering a lot of uh, that portion of our roots. Um, and I'm trying to keep up on that, too, because that is definitely a, an important part of uh, my family history. Um, but this side of the island where the observatory was built was the interior part of the island was pretty much not highly populated in the 1960s. Um, it's because it's a lot of mountains, a lot of cars train, so it was difficult to settle it. Um, so it wasn't that uh, highly used, but I do believe the United States kind of used the whole, um, what's it called, dominant train or whatever. Uh, <laughs> imminent domain, thank you. I'm really glad <laughs> where they ended up just taking over. Um, but I don't think it angered people. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Ed, if you take your mouse and you go to the left-hand side of the screen and you click the Q&A button. I click things and then I click more things. On the... Q&A, got it. Yes. All right. So it should have opened up, and here's a question. We'll select it here. We have a question from online. All right, good question. So how far away, basically how far away can we observe these objects? So... That comes into play about um, how we move. Uh, the tele uh, remember, the dish itself is stationary, unlike uh, goldstones. Theirs can move. Ours can't. Um, and so they could track an object for a further amount of time. If we could do that, so remember when we're also observing these, we're emitting light. So we have to wait for that light that we emit to come back. And so our restriction is how long can we track this object. So it turns out it's about 2.6 hours. And when you look at how long light can travel and uh, hit something and come back, that sets our limit to objects beyond Saturn. So we can go up to uh, the satellites, the icy satellites of Saturn. One of my favorites, if you follow me on Twitter, Iapetus. Iapetus is awesome. Um, but beyond that, we can't because we just can't wait long enough for the light to come back and still hit the dish and focus in on our platform. So about 2.6 hours, which means Saturn. Next question. Next question. Uh, right, Fred? So I'll hit done on that one, and then I will select the next one from Craig. You want to read that one? So I was trying to read it before, too. Um, so, besides, uh, Craig asked, besides the incredible power usage requirements uh, that we have here, would it be possible to continually transmit a field of view, like a curtain, and just calculate what you can observe, or if, there are too, or if there's too much of a risk of collecting observations of everything noisy? All right, so that comes into play kind of how radar works. So, good question, because I, I think I skipped over this in the talk, in that radar doesn't discover new objects. So we have the observ uh, optical observers say, hey, there might be something there. And they'll give us their information, and then we go back into our system, we try to predict where the object is, and then we'll emit a radio burst, uh, radar burst, hits it back, and try to see, are we picking up signal to see this object? So we confirm observations of that were made optically. Um, and it is, again, with this whole, because if we just randomly emit radio waves up, we end up getting too much uh, noise, and we start uh, you start losing confidence in high signals that you can get back. So good question. It, I totally had to skip that in the talk. OK, that's, that's pretty cool. That's neat. That you would think that it would make sense to just sweep out that beam, and you just basically as the Earth goes around the, uh, the sun, you would eventually map everything. But you can't, right? It's just not going to work. That's cool. That's cool. All right. Uh, any other questions here before I get to ask my favorite question? <laughs> All right. Well, one of my favorite questions is, 
what advice would you give to young people? You know, these guys are uh, currently undergraduates in the physics uh, program. What advice would you give to young people now if you could talk to your former self uh, back in time? What would you give advice to these guys now? Yeah, good question. So, when I was your age, back in the good old days, you know, Facebook <laughs> started, you know, MySpace was still around, you know, so long ago. Um, no, one of the things I cared about at that age, um, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I knew as a kid I liked physics, I liked math, and I kind of wanted to do something spacey. But it turns out astronomy, there's a lot to do in astronomy. There's cosmology, there's black holes, there's galaxies, there's star formation, there's how do you form those galaxies, there's dark matter and dark energy, and then the planets near you. There's a lot to do, and you're at the right age, at the right section of your career, that you shouldn't limit yourself. I took different classes from astrophysics, cosmology, down to the geology of Mars and the geology of Venus. I tried to take internships, um, summer internships, where I studied the sun, one was, uh, at the observatory that we had at Alfred University. Um, and the other one, I was able to do research at the Lunar and Planetary Institute, and I got to study the icy solids of Saturn. And that's where I ended up going, oh wait, I like the fact that we have spacecraft going around these moons, these icy moons, and we could study these things. And the fact that these icy moons are basically snowballs, and that they have all these interesting thermal processes happening inside of them, that they have maybe massive oceans under there, that they could host life. That's when I finally figured out I, in astronomy, I want to do planetary astronomy. That was towards the end of my senior year in undergrad. Um, and so you are at the right age. Discover. Take your classes. Um, you might discover you're in the physics program, but you'll take a biology class, and you might like that. So you might want to go into biophysics. Uh, you might take a chemistry class, and you might learn that you want to do material sciences. This is the right point to start experimenting with all the awesome sciences that there are. And, then maybe start narrowing yourself when you go to grad school and say, okay, now I know I really love this. This is where my passion lies, and this is where I want to spend my time doing the research. So my suggestion is explore. That's what we do in science, explore. Solve your curiosity. Fantastic. That is awesome. That's really good advice. We, we really encourage our students to go to uh, and do REUs and to do some summer internships. And you're right, that experience of getting away and seeing a different lab uh, is really cool. Uh, speaking of REUs, uh, does Hiroshibo have any uh, uh, summer programs? Good leeway. <laughs> so, the NSU Observatory does have a research experience for undergraduate program. Please do apply. Uh, the application deadline is normally in January, and then we start sometime in late May and end in early August. So this year, we already have our group. Um, but next year, apply by January, I'll still be here, and if I see the UCA application, I will smile, and I will definitely try to help you out. So, apply. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so uh, sort of what do you see in your career? Do you, you feel like you could stay uh, there at Airsibo, or are you thinking of um, going someplace else? What's your plan? So, I kind of met this little goal of my life a little early. I do, you know, I, I reached, I, when I was an undergrad and did my internship, I got to work for NASA at LPI, and then sometime in grad school, I got to work for JSC, JPL, so I, yeah, I worked for NASA. I got to invent a whole new equation, so that was pretty cool, but that was still in grad school, and now, uh, about two years out of getting my PhD, I was able to come from a postdoc at Brown to another huge goal, which was get to work where the place that inspired me to go into science. Um, and I kind of want to continue that in that I'm back home and I feel like I should give back to my local community. So I'm actually starting to set up EPO programs, trying to help out the local high schools. I'm trying to involve myself while at the observatory to do outreach programs to help the community get involved in STEM research. Um, there are opportunities that are rising so I can also teach a couple classes at the local universities um, and get uh, astronomy and planetary science as part of the curriculum down here. So I'm pretty excited about that. So I would envision myself staying here a very long time because I really want to help out Puerto Rico and 
you know, we have this amazing instrument here. We have the Odyssey Observatory. We're still the largest single dish telescope. We have one of the best sensitivities. And I want to get people to hear about what we do and get involved. Um, like I said, I'm the first Odyssey venue to get to work here. And I don't want to be the last. I want a bunch of us to come back here, a bunch of Puerto Ricans to be here and get involved in the awesome science we do here. Cool. Do, do uh, the people uh, that live around and near the uh, observatory, do they have a, a positive uh, feeling towards the observatory? Do they understand sort of what goes on there? Or, or is or it like most places where people feel like, oh, well, it's just stuff that I don't know what happens there and sort of walled off? No, we have an excellent visitor center. Um, pretty much it's open from, I believe it was Wednesday through Sunday. And every time I come into work, any of those days, the parking lot is filled. It brings a lot of students from elementary, middle, to high school, to undergrads to come up here and visit the visitor center, teaches them what we do. Um, I, what I like to do is every once in a while, I'll walk up to the visitor center, I'll find a nice group of people, and I'll be like, hey, do you want a back of the scenes tour? Let me show you the dish and the under the dish. Um, so if you come down here, you might randomly see me, and I might randomly bring you over here. So the observatory is definitely involved in trying to help the community learn what we do. And everyone, I mean, the observatory is definitely something that the Puerto Rican people, and especially the people from Adecibo, are very proud of. We're proud that we have this uh, instrument here for the use of the world. Cool. Cool. Looks like we picked up another question on our Q&A. Do you see it there? Uh, yes, Tim. Oh, I know, Tim. Um, <laughs> have you ever teamed up with another observatory to expand the distance of objects? So, to expand the distance of objects that we observed, I don't believe so. But what we do a lot is we do bi-static observations. So, recently, we did one where we emitted to the moon, and then an observatory over in Virginia collected the data. And so that gives them a little bit of different viewing angle. We've also done it... Uh, we did a run with 2004 BLA-6 where we emitted, and then as the asteroid was re-emitting down, uh, a different observatories across the nation were able to pick up the shadow, and as the asteroid rotated, they picked up different parts of the shadow called speckle observations. Um, and so we do work with other observatories to try to enhance the type of information we get from these asteroids. Cool. Fantastic. Well, Thanks, do we have any other questions we have for this wonderful presenter that we've got tonight? No? Looks like we've gone through our Q&A there. Let's give our speaker one last round of applause. <laughs> All right. Well, Ed, thank you very much. All right. <laughs> Team Live long prosper, my friends. <laughs> thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. Uh, I'll be shooting you an email to kind of follow up with this later on tonight or tomorrow. So thanks again. Really appreciate it. Great seminar. No problem. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Buenas noches. <laughs>